I will be talking about potential for learning analogy problem solving. And um, what I'd also like to do is zoom in on the potential role of executive functioning. And I'm assuming that the term executive functions is, uh, um, is something that you're all aware of, right? It doesn't, it's not new, is it? I think most a lot of us knows. Be, but maybe worth yeah. giving a bullet point explanation. Yeah, we'll do in some at some point. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to keep it within the thirty minute uh, uh, time frame that I have. But I, knowing myself, I can be a little bit enthusiastic. So if I uh, just yap, keep on yapping, uh, just let me know. Okay, so what's on today's uh, program? First of all, uh, a short framework of. Uh, uh, measuring potential. Uh, what do we do when we measure someone's potential for learning and how is it different? And uh, the vehicle that we use or the instrument that we use is something we call dynamic testing or dynamic assessment. So I want to say something about that briefly, why it's important and how we do it. Then I'd like to uh, talk about the relationship with executive functioning and uh, it will come back in one of the slides that I have. And then I'd like to uh, talk about one of the studies that we did in our lab uh, in which we investigated relationships between dynamic testing outcomes and executive functions. And one of the most important questions is, does dynamic testing of analogical reasoning compensate for weaknesses in executive functions? And I hope that at the end of the presentation today, we'll have an answer to that question. Everything okay? Everything okay? Um, you can understand me well, sound is okay? Perfect, all good. Good, okay. So. Let me get started. So first of all, what we usually do when we dynamically test a, a person, very often a child, is that we do that within the domain of inductive reasoning. And as you're, of course, aware of, uh, analogical reasoning is a subtype of inductive reasoning. So I'm not going to say much about inductive reasoning because you're developing experts as it is, I should imagine. But what I do want to say is uh, why do we use inductive reasoning and specifically analogical reasoning in dynamic tests? Well, because they play such a central role in so many cognitive skills and processes, among which, of course, G. Uh, general intelligence, but also problem solving, everyday learning, transfer, so application uh, of knowledge, generalization, uh, and so on. But what is important is that very often analogical reasoning is measured by means of static tests. For instance, the Raven progressive matrices, that's a traditional static test. And what do we mean by the term static test? Static basically means very often it's a one-time administration um, the child or the individual gets a very short standardized instruction and after that instruction the child solves tasks independently so it's static uh, and the result is that um, the test outcomes show what that child at that point in time has already acquired in terms of knowledge and skills that enable the child to perform in a certain way. Is that clear for you guys? So static means one-time testing, no help is given, child solves tasks independently. And as a result, what you basically measure is that which the child has already mastered in the past. And that's a very important starting point. I'll come back to that later in more detail. Uh, I'd just like to give you guys some examples of some of the analogy reasoning tasks that we use in our lab. This is a, a visual spatial analogy item of the type A stands to B as C stands to D. And this is also the type of analogies that I will talk about later today that we use in our research. Um, we use this already for children uh, uh, of the age five to ten years old and 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 just for your information, this item, um, children of five years old can solve this item when they had training. So um, just to give you a little bit of insight into uh, what the children can do at a certain age. This is another example for young children. We call this Animologica. Same sort of um, uh, analogy. A stands to B as C stands to D, but then uh, uh, it's in a square rather than um, the boxes being next to each other. Okay, so let me say let me say a little bit more about dynamic testing because dynamic testing is 
uh, the instrument we use to assess children's potential for learning. And it is basically uh, uh, based on uh, Vygotsky's theory of the zone of proximal development. Are you guys familiar with that theory, that model? Maybe, maybe not. I'll just explain it briefly. So the idea is that um, learning never takes place in a vacuum. So learning is a social construct. Learning is something we do with and from other people that are very often experts in that specific task that we're learning. And the zone of proximal development, within that zone, learning takes place. The zone of proximal development consists of, on the one hand, independent problem solving. So that is uh, uh, that level of problem solving that the child has reached independently. So it's indicative of what the child can do now, the actual developmental level. On the other hand, in the zone of proximal development, there's also the proximal level of development. And the proximal develop, hang on, let me see. Uh, the, the proximal or the potential level of development, that is that which a child can achieve after getting help from an expert, a more knowledgeable other is what Vygotsky basically says. So learning takes place within this zone. And the idea is that when children learn, they move from the actual level of development, that which a child can do unassisted on their own, uh, to the potential level of development, that which a child can do when they've been given help by others. So a dynamic test tries to tap into this zone of proximal development by measuring not only the actual level of development, which is something we measure by means of a static test, right? Uh, what I explained in the previous slide. And it also taps into the potential level of development. And because many dynamic tests have a pre-test training post-test format that enables us to not only measure the actual level of development pre-test, but also the potential level of development post-test, and more importantly, that which happens during the intervention, during training. Because what happens during training uh, provides us with an indication of the instructional needs and henceforth educational needs of individual learners. And that, of course, provides hands-on information for educationalists and other educational professionals to base didactic or maybe pedagogic interventions. So the idea, Vygotsky's idea was that if we test children by means of conventional static tests, we only measure their actual level of development, which is not necessarily predict predictive of future learning. And in order to really assess potential for learning, you need to know what is their potential level of development. So that's why we, we, we are so keen on uh, the zone of proximal development. So just some quotes on the, on the slide. I won't go into much detail due to uh, the time. Um, so during training, we very often provide scaffolding. And scaffolding, you know what a scaffold is, right? These, a lovely picture of a scaffold. So scaffolds basically help make the structure of buildings more uh, uh, concrete. Uh, also help to uh, make the building larger, as it were. And you do the same thing with children when you provide scaffolding. So scaffolding means you give them help and you take that help away gradually with the main aim of uh, getting children to uh, move from external regulation to internal regulation. That means that in the beginning of the learning process, basically you, as the tester, uh, um, regulate the learning process of the child because it's something they haven't done before. Meanwhile, you gradually take away the help that you give to make sure that the child can, interna intern can internalize the regulation and regulates the learning process themselves. So that's why we use scaffolds. And um, in dynamic testing, assessment and learning are, as it were, two sides of one coin. So it's a form of testing, like I said, pre-test training, post-test, in which feedback and instruction are part of the testing process, rather than being a, a measurement error, as it is usually seen in the static traditional test. So the main objectives are focusing on the potential level of development, providing insight into children's cognitive weaknesses and strengths, their individual instructional needs, 
And what we do is we focus on the potential instructional needs rather than previously obtained knowledge and skills. So, and what we do is the outcomes of dynamic testing, we usually call potential for learning, ability to learn or learning potential. And in that respect, it's also linked to Binet's uh, ideas about measuring intelligence, who said intelligence is the ability to learn. Right, okay, so just very briefly what I discussed already, and, and here I will also uh, outline why executive functioning is so important, because in static tests, as it were, schools are very much dependent on learner characteristics such as test taking abilities, test anxiety, but also executive functioning, because taking a test assumes that you have certain test taking skills and if you don't that means that your working memory may get overloaded very easily which means that you can't perform as well as you potentially could so if you have weaknesses in executive functions such as attention working memory or cognitive flexibility that means that chances are you won't perform as well as you potentially can so because in dynamic testing, we offer a child or, or an adult for that matter, assistance. The idea is that they, uh, the outcomes, so on the post-test, uh, post-test schools are less dependent on these learner characteristics and definitely executive functioning. Because you provide training, you, as it were, compensate for working memory deficits and so on. So that's why I'm so interested in the role of executive functions. So very often uh, they have these tests have a pretest uh, training post test design, as you can see in this slide. And as I said before, pretest means um, you tap into the actual level of development. Post test is related to the potential level of development. And the idea is that we say the pretest is a static measure, no help was given. The instructional needs that we uh, derive from the intervention or the trading are a dynamic measure and the post-test are another example of a dynamic measure. So how do we measure potential for learning? We look at the post-test score, we look at the instructional needs and we look at the progression from pre-test to post-test. So how much has the child improved? Gain score, sometimes it's also called. And all this information together provides us with insight into what a child is potentially capable of rather than just, as it were, saying the child scores on the 90th percentile or the 85th percentile, or this child has an IQ of 105, because IQs and percentiles are uh, provide information because you compare a child to other children of the same age or other adults of the same age group. But within a dynamic test, you compare the child to him or herself, which gives a lot of hands-on uh, feedback about the uh, learning process. So far, so good? Yeah? Okay. Lovely. Oh, I said this already. Okay. So what we do during training is very often something we call graduated prompts. I won't go into it in too much detail, but what is important for you guys to know is what we try to do is measure the, um, uh, well, in, in English, this term is a little bit awkward. It comes from German, Kleinsmögliche Hilfe. But what we try to uh, uh, measure is uh, the different degrees of help that individuals need. And what we do when we provide help is the first step is always a very general metacognitive prompt. For instance, so what did you do last time? First, have a very good look, then think, and then provide your answer. Uh, and the, for us, this might, might sound like it's not helpful at all, but for, for a lot of children, even adults, that is indeed helpful because it activates metacognition. So what you do during training is you provide a similar item as you did dur during pretest, but now if the, the individual shows that they are not capable of solving the item themselves, the first step is a very general metacognitive prompt. If then you let the, the individual try again, if the answer is incorrect, you give another metacognitive prompt. Try again. Incorrect, you move on to cognitive scaffolds, which are much more specified and concrete, so much more tailored to the individual item. And in the cognitive scaffolds or prompts, what you usually do is that you provide a little piece of the, of, of the solving solution or the solving strategy. So first look at the at the pictures in books as A and B. What do you see? They seem similar, but they are different. How come? Because that activates 
uh, the previous knowledge, but also uh, um, provides a little answer of a little piece of the answer towards uh, the solving that item. Then you move on to modeling. So step by step, you show the individual what the correct answer is. And the final step is verbalization. So you always ask the child to tell you why they think the answer they chose is or is not correct. So a self-explanation. Um, and because you always start off with very uh, general prompts that become ever more specific with each new prompt, the idea is that you measure the minimally needed number of prompts. Well, as I said, a little bit awkward in English, but we just need to make two. Okay, so um, let me see. Moving on, because I only have 10 minutes left, <laughs> time really does fly, to a study that was uh, published last year in Journal of uh, Computer Assisted Learning. And um, in this study, we focused on the effectiveness of the computerized dynamic testing of analogical reasoning. Uh, why computerized? Well, because one of the drawbacks of, of dynamic testing is that it takes a lot of time. And the time is money. So people sometimes say, why would we test dynamically if it takes such if it takes much more time than testing someone statically. Uh, and by means of computerized testing, you sort of try to solve the problem of dynamic testing being very labor intensive, because if the children do it on the computer, you can test them group wise, as it were. And this, um, what we did was we used a test that I developed before, but now we made it, uh, uh, we computerized it. So we digitalized it. So the prompts were provided by the computer rather than by an individual test taker. And so we wanted to see, is it effective? Secondly, we wanted to check the influence, potential influence of executive functioning on analogical reasoning. So is it the fact that dynamic testing compensates for these weaker executive functions? And how did we, uh, potential weaker executive functions, how did we measure that? Well, by trying to uh, uh, gain insight into the predictive value of executive functions on pretest scores, versus post-test scores. And the idea was that if the executive functions would predict pretest scores, that means that, uh, of course, the, the, the pretest is dependent on a child's level of executive functioning. And if it is on the post-test, if it doesn't predict the post-test, then apparently the post-test is not dependent on executive functions. Hence, dynamic testing compensates for weaker executive functions. Okay. So um, the analogy items that we used are these items, the same ones that I showed you before, but now uh, because the program was computerized, uh, what was very lovely was that children had to construct their own answers. So what they had to do was uh, drag these shapes to the empty box. And then by, by pressing on these buttons, they could either rotate, uh, cut in half, uh, mirror, flip, make it larger, make it smaller, or undo. And what is excellent about this procedure is that we, we did not only measure accuracy, so successful solving, we also measured the process of solving analogies because the computer recorded every step that the child took. So not only time, so timestamps, uh, thinking time, Exec execution time, evaluation time, but also each little step of the problem solving process. So what we did was in this study, we focused on two measures of analogical reasoning, outcome measure, so product measure, accuracy, but also the number of transformations that children applied correctly. And are you guys familiar with the term transformations? Transformations would mean the differences in the uh, uh, geometric shapes from A to B. So for instance, in this item, you would say this large triangle um, moves location, one transformation, it changes uh, size, two trans so that's two transformations in general, and it also changes um, rotation. So that's three transformations for this one triangle. This what is it, a hex hexagon, I think, in English, no? Yes, hexagon. Yeah. This hexagon has one transformation, one to two. And then, so that's already four transformations in total in this item, yeah? And then the, um, no, hang on, I meant the pentagon, sorry. The hexagon is six, 
right? Yeah. So the hexagon has um, two transformations, size and location, and the pentagon has one transformation. Apologies. So in, in this, you can see how many transformations are included in one item. The idea is the more transformations, the more difficult the item is. But transformations is a process variable because it tells us something about the process of analogical reasoning. Sometimes individuals understand the analogical reasoning principles, but still they can't get to an accurate solution because they just don't see, for instance, that uh, this triangle was rotated. And then they miss rotation. The item is incorrect, but the child did actually show correct uh, um, um, in the process of ana analogical problem solving, they did show some correct steps. And if you take transformations as outcome uh, variable, that gives information about the process of solving analogies, hence for the learning process. Okay, so the design was as follows, 64 children be, uh, between seven and eight years of age, um, we had an experimental design, so half of the children were trained, the other half were not. Why? Well, because we needed to check the effectiveness of training. And what is interesting for you is that we uh, used um, um, two measures for, um, for executive functioning, uh, the trail making test, which you see here, which measures in part A, um, attention, and in part B, flexibility, because in part B, children need to switch from 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, and so on. So that measures flexibility. Tower of Hanoi measures planning, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with that task. In this design, you also see the raven because we use the raven to uh, divide children into the two uh, conditions to make sure we had two equal conditions in terms of initial reasoning abilities. Okay, so. Let's focus on the uh, on the outcomes. Here you see two graphs. In the left graph, you see the outcomes for accuracy. The green line is uh, is the line of the children that were trained, and the blue line is the line of children that were not trained. And what do we see in terms of accuracy? Both groups of children improved in accuracy, which of course is to be expected. But uh, and I didn't. I don't think I included the uh, statistics. But the repeated measures ANOVA also showed that the children in the training condition uh, um, improved significantly more, which means the training was effective. Why then did the children also improve? Uh, those children in the control condition, well, because there's a learning effect. Because of course they tried and they they practiced and they practiced uh, in pretest and in posttest. So practicing already leads to learning. Uh, the same thing can be said when we look at the transformations. So in terms of transformations, you also see a larger improvement for those who were trained than those who were not trained. So this is lovely for the first research question because yay, our training was indeed effective, even though it was computerized and not uh, provided uh, by an individual test leader. Now let's look at the predictive value of executive functions. So what can we say about that? Um, what you see here is the um, uh, executive function, so planning, two measures, so completion time and efficiency, um, because if executive functions are such a complex uh, process, we usually try to take into account different measures uh, to indicate ex executive functioning, so both an efficiency uh, measure, which is completion time, no, hang on, which is um, this measure, efficiency, as well as a time measure. And um, we try to predict pre-test and post-test both accuracy and transformations. And what's important for you guys is that for post-test, we looked at the children in the two conditions separately because post-test scores of those who were trained are of course very different to post-test scores of those who were not trained. And what did we find? We found that cognitive flexibility significantly predicts pre-test accuracy and pretest transformations. In other words, those who had weaker cognitive flexibility did, uh, no, yeah, let me um, 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 reframe it. Those who had stronger uh, cognitive flexibility did better on the pretest, so had higher accuracy and more accurately applied transformations. And um, the same can be said for post test. So at the post test, for those who were not trained, we also see that those who had uh, uh, good 
um, cognitive flexibility also did better on the post test. Interestingly, those who were trained, oh, hang on, let me go back. For those who were trained, you see, that's this column, that none of the executive functions predicted how well children uh, uh, performed in terms of accuracy as well as in terms of transformations. So it seems already here that uh, exec that um, cognitive flexibility only predicted static measures and not the uh, dynamic measure. So this is already the first indication that testing someone dynamically does indeed compensate for weaknesses in executive functions. Now, what we also did was that we looked at the instructional needs. And what we did in terms of instructional needs is that we differentiated between metacognitive prompts, so these very general prompts, cognitive prompts, those uh, tailor-made item-specific prompts, as well as the modeling prompts and all the prompts in total. And what did we see? Interestingly enough, we saw that attention, but also cognitive flexibility, both predicted the number of metacognitive prompts. And here, the, re the relationship was uh, different in the sense that those who had uh, weaker attention had needed more prompts. Those who had weaker uh, cognitive flexibility needed more prompts in terms of metacognitive prompts. In terms of cognitive prompts, we saw the same thing, but then only for cognitive flexibility. Modeling, same thing, only cognitive flexibility. And if we looked at the prompts in total, only cognitive flexibility could predict a number of prompts. So cognitive flexibility is related to static measures of analogical reasoning, but also related to the instructions that children need when they get training. In other words, those who have weaker executive functions, specifically weaker cognitive flexibility, need more help and also more specific help. And interestingly, when we give these children these, uh, this specific help, when they try again to solve analogy items, apparently the level of cognitive flexibility does not, is not related to how well they perform. So... If you suspect weaker executive functions, chances are that children, but also maybe adults, will underperform on a traditional measure of analogical reasoning. So if you expect weaker executive functions, it's always a good idea to test dynamically because that compensates to an extent for weaker executive functions. Right, I, it's half now. I have a conclusion, but I think I, I said it already. Um, so, I did. So dynamically test the children, more improvement, uh, which is lovely because training works. Also, uh, executive functions, dynamic testing apparently compensates for these weaknesses. Uh, we saw this already. Um, well within the time limit. Well done, me. Um, any questions? Shall I stop sharing, Matt? Is that, is that handy? <laughs>